Thanks for uh, coming out, everybody. The name of the talk is The Rise and Fall with a question mark after fall of the opioid epidemic. And uh, the question mark is there because we're not falling yet. <clears throat> My hope is that in the next year or so, we will begin to see a reduction in deaths from opioid overdoses, but we're not there yet. And unfortunately, the number of opioid overdose deaths is continuing to increase at this point. The goals of tonight's talk are to review the history of opium and opioids, to learn the causes of today's opioid epidemic, to understand the role of prescribers like myself and patients and lay people like yourselves, and to learn how each of us can work together to help this epidemic. So to start things out, let me just ask you, what's your experience? Who here, is, who here has personally known someone uh, with an opioid problem, either abuse, dependence, addiction, ER visits, rehab, overdoses, or deaths? Hands? So about uh, two-thirds of the people in the audience. And that's usually uh, about the response that I get when I ask that question <clears throat> as I've been speaking uh, to both medical groups and lay people groups throughout the state in the past year. In 1990, there were about 9,000 deaths from opioid overdoses in the United States. Ten years later, that number had almost doubled, and by 2010, that number had more than doubled again. In 2015, there were 52,000 deaths, and in 2016, 64,000 deaths, which was a 23% increase in just one year. And so far, the uh, data that we're seeing so far from 2017 looks like that's going to set another record above 2016. And about 75% of those drug or those deaths involve opioids, either legally prescribed opioids or illegal opioids such as heroin or fentanyl. In fact, drug overdose deaths are now the number one cause of death in the United States between the ages of 15 and 50. Now, if we look at that 64,000 number in, 2000, in just one year, that compares to the total number of motor vehicle accident deaths in that year, which was 40,000, the number of deaths from HIV and AIDS in the peak year of that epidemic, 95, of 47,000, the number of firearm deaths in the peak year of the firearm deaths, 1993, of 39,000. In fact, that 64,000 deaths number is greater than the total number of Americans that lost their lives in the entire 11 years of the Vietnam War, which was 58,000. Now, in Connecticut, in 2016, there are about 306 deaths from motor vehicle accidents, but there are three times that number of deaths from drug overdoses. And that's about a 150% increase in just four years. Not 50%, but 150% increase. About 80% of those deaths involve opioids. And whereas years ago, when I started practicing medicine in Connecticut in 1985, uh, the people that we saw coming into the emergency department with opioid overdoses tended to be from heroin overdoses. They tend to be people of color that uh, lived in the, in the inner cities, such as New Haven or New York or New London. Now, most of these people are white who are dying, and the majority of them are male. Now, if you're a parent like I am, and you've had kids or do have kids that started driving or will be started driving soon, we know how much we worry about when they first get that license and start driving. We stay up late at night waiting for them to come home to be sure they're safe. The reality is for kids today, they're three times as likely to die from drug overdoses as they are from motor vehicle accidents. Now, this is a picture of a opium poppy field an opium farmer, this could be in Afghanistan or uh, Myanmar or Thailand. And uh, in the upper right hand corner, you can see a close up of an opium poppy bulb. The farmers make shallow slits in those bulbs at a certain stage of the opium poppy's growth. And the uh, bulb secretes a thick, milky substance, which is called opium latex. That substance uh, contains morphine and also contains another drug called thebane. And from morphine or, or thebane, most of the opioids that we are familiar with and that we're gonna be talking tonight are derived from either morphine or thebane. Now let's take a look at the history of opium. As early as 4000 BC, we know that it was cultivated and used for a variety of medical uses, such as treating pain, calming irritable infants, 
suppressing coughs, treating diarrhea, or being used as a tranquilizer. And that is early, it was used recreationally for non-medical reasons as early as the 1300s in the Ottoman Empire, which is essentially the modern Middle East. In the 1600s in China, opium was mixed with tobacco and then smoked in long stem pipes because it's much stronger when it's taken through the respiratory tract than when it's taken through the uh, gastrointestinal tract. And that's when addiction, opioid addiction, was first described and, uh, and documented. <clears throat> in fact, it was such a problem that in 1729, opium was outlawed in China. But in the 1840s, uh, the English had a problem. Uh, they really enjoyed Chinese tea. They were spending a lot of money buying tea from China, and they didn't have much to sell to the Chinese to balance the payments. Well, they discovered that opium was a great way to balance the payments. India, which was a, a colony of, of uh, the British Empire, uh, grew opium, and that opium was exported to and imported to chi uh, exported to China. Well, the Chinese didn't want this to happen for obvious reasons, and the British did. They actually fought two wars over this, which are now known as the Opium Wars, in the 1840s. In both of those wars, the British Empire won, and the result of that was there continued to be unrestricted importing of Indian opium into China. The result of that was that opium use in China became very widespread, and by 1905, about 25% of males in China were regular opium users. This is a picture of an opium den. And you can see these men are smoking the opium in these long stem pipes. Again, the opium is mixed with tobacco when it's smoked in these pipes. Now, coming to the United States, in the Civil War, opium and morphine were widely used for battlefield injuries. In fact, by the end of the war, there were about 400,000 soldiers, both Confederate and Union, that were, became addicted to morphine or opium, and morphine addiction actually was known as a soldier's disease. In the late 1800s, uh, Chinese immigrants uh, coming to the United States were working on the Transcontinental Railroad or participating in the gold rushes out west, and with them they brought their fondness for opium. And opium dens began op uh, opening on both coasts, the west coast and the east coast. In the 1870s, the opium dens were out were outlawed, but they continued to operate underground to some degree until around World War II. Now, from opium, uh, drug companies have derived most of the opioids that we're going to talk about tonight. So these are called semi-synthetic opioids, or it starts with the opium, the powder from the opium poppy itself, and then they're processed in laboratories run by uh, pharmaceutical companies into the drugs that we are going to talk about. Those old pharmaceutical companies were based, are based in the United States and Europe. So morphine was developed and patented in 1804, codeine in 1832, diacetylmorphine, which we now know as heroin, in 1898, hydrocodone, which is the opioid that's in Vicodin in 1920, hydromorphone, which we call dilaudid in 1924, oxycodone, which is in Percocet, uh, Oxycontin and Oxycodone itself in 1927, and Methadone in 1937. So let's talk a little bit about heroin. The generic name of heroin is uh, for heroin, or the chemical name is diacetylmorphine. It was actually developed and patented by Bayer Pharmaceuticals and named heroin in 1898. I think it's a great name. It sounds sort of like heroic or being a hero. It's a great marketing name. In fact, it was such a great name that that's what we continue to call it today, even more than 100 years later. Believe it or not, it was marketed by Bayer as a non-addicting treatment for morphine addiction. <clears throat> now, that seems ridiculous. We know that heroin is highly addicting. But nonetheless, it was marketed as a non-addicting medication. And 100 years later, we're going to see, another drug was also marketed in the United States as a non-addicting opioid, and that was or is OxyContin. In 1906, heroin was approved by the American Medical Association as a, as a replacement for morphine. But in 1914, there were already 200,000 heroin addicts in New York City alone. That's when the Harrison Narcotics Act was passed by Congress, which outlawed the, the uh, non-medical use of heroin. In 1924, heroin was outlawed for 
medical use. So it's been completely illegal in any form whatsoever in the United States since 1924. From the 1900s to the 1980s, opioids in the United States were only prescribed for acute and severe pain. They weren't used for chronic pain, and the vast majority of opioid addicts, as I said before, were heroin addicts that were primarily living in the inner cities. And the opioid epidemic that we read about in the papers every day and that we're talking about tonight had, had not begun. Well, when did the opioid epidemic begin? It began in 1996. In 1996, the Federal Drug Administration gave approval to a Connecticut-based drug company called Purdue Pharma to market uh, OxyContin, which is a long-acting form of oxycodone, uh, to market it for non-cancer pain. Prior to that, the only people that, uh, that opioids were approved for on a chronic basis were people that had terminal cancer, people that were dying of cancer. Well, Purdue was very aggressive in terms of their marketing. Uh, they began a campaign trying to convince the public and the medical profession that pain in the United States was being undertreated, and that OxyContin was not addicting that under 1% of the people that took OxyContin became addicted to it. In 2007, Purdue was found guilty to a federal lawsuit charging that they falsely marketed OxyContin, that they knew that claim was false, and they pleaded guilty and they paid over a $600 million fine. And even today, there are multiple lawsuits ongoing by states and cities, some cities in Connecticut as well, against Purdue and other drug companies for falsely marketing OxyContin and other uh, opioids. But nonetheless, in 1996, we began seeing a lot of pressure for doctors and dentists and other people, other prescribers, to prescribe more opioids. Again, in 1996, when OxyContin was approved by the Federal Drug Administration for treatment of non-cancer pain, Purdue began its marketing campaign, again, convincing the American public and the medical profession that pain was being undertreated. In fact, it was called the Undertreated Pain Movement. And the claim was made, again, that OxyContin was under 1% addicting. Well, how is someone able to make a claim like that in today's modern world? There were no good drug studies that were not sponsored by Purdue or other drug companies that show that it wasn't addicting. And uh, Purdue actually paid physician speakers to speak at medical conferences and dental conferences around the country, uh, claiming that this was a, an appropriate treatment for chronic pain and that it wasn't addicting. Well, there was a letter to the editor <clears throat> in the New England Journal of Medicine, a one-paragraph letter to the editor prior to this that, by two doctors at one hospital that said that in their experience uh, of the patients that they had cared for that had received opioids during their hospitalization, under 1% of them ended up becoming addicted to it. Now, this was, a, uh, this was called what we called an anecdotal study. It was an observation. It wasn't a formal study. It wasn't published as, in, as a, uh, it was simply a letter to the editor. It wasn't a formal study published in the New England Journal or other uh, medications. And since that time, those two doctors have regretted their claims and basically said they were sorry they wrote down what they, what they had. But nonetheless, Purdue Pharmaceuticals used that claim, used that letter to the editor, uh, and reproduced it at hundreds and hundreds of medical conferences around the country to get convince the medical profession that OxyContin was safe to use for chronic pain and was not addicting. In 2000, the Joint Commission, which is also known as the Joint Commission for the Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, uh, created the pain scale. Now, the Joint Commission uh, is a regulatory agency that regulates hospitals and nursing homes. Um, and if a hospital, and they, and they create standards for, the treat, for medical care in hospitals and nursing homes, and they inspect hospitals and nursing homes on an annual basis to be sure that those standards are being followed. And the Joint Commission has tremendous power because if a hospital or nursing home doesn't get approval from the Joint Commission, then that hospital or nursing home can't receive Medicare or Medicaid dollars. And if a hospital or nursing home can't receive Medicare or Medicaid dollars, they go out of business very, very rapidly. So what the Joint Commission says goes. They basically uh, mandated that when vital signs are taken in hospitals and nursing homes, there are four vital signs, that, uh, that the patients be asked about pain. Do you have pain? And if the patient says yes, they're asked to grade the pain on a zero to 10 scale. Zero is no pain whatsoever, 
10 is the worst pain you've ever had in your life. It became known as the fifth vital sign. The other four vital signs are temperature, pulse, blood pressure, and respirations. Those are things that can be easily measured by very basic equipment or simply observation in a doctor's office. Uh, but pain is something that is subjective. In other words, we have no tools to measure pain. Uh, pain is a subjective sensation. We're asking people to convert that subjective sensation pain into a number. And joint, the Joint Commission, which is also known as JCAA, JCAHO, uh, basically mandated that any pain greater than zero needed to be treated. And it, it needed, the treatment of that pain needed to be documented. So this began to create an impression in the American public and in the medical profession that everyone should live lives that are totally pain-free. We should all be at zero all the time. Now, I'm not a spring chicken, and a couple of you in the audience aren't either, and I think uh, we all know that we have aches and pains periodically. But we're not taking opioids every time we have an ache and pain when we turn our back in the car or bend over to pick up a soap, a soap in the shower or have stiff joints in the morning when we get out of bed. But nonetheless, the Joint Commission expected and mandated that pain, any pain greater than zero, any pain whatsoever, be treated until it's gone. In the 2000s, there were patient satisfaction surveys that became widespread in hospitals, in emergency departments like my own, in doctor's offices. And one of those questions was, did the provider adequately control your pain? And the answers to those questions and uh, in, in the, the results of those surveys actually affected reimbursement of physicians and hospitals uh, throughout the country. So beginning in 1996, we began, number one, being falsely educated, the public and the medical profession being falsely educated that opioids could be treated, used for chronic pain and they weren't addicting. We had the major regulatory agency in the medical industry basically demanding that the subjective sensation of pain be given an objective number and that anyone who has any pain whatsoever be treated aggressively. And there were actually financial incentives for doctors and for hospitals to treat that pain aggressively. Well. The result was predictable. On the blue line here, we see the growth of opioid prescriptions from 1999 to 2013. Opioid prescriptions quadrupled beginning in 1996, and they peaked around 2011, 2012. The red line is deaths from overdoses from legally prescribed opioids, which also skyrocketed and pretty much paralleled the number of prescriptions that were written. A few things about this graph. Number one, it only goes up to 2013, does not extend to 2017. I can tell you that the number of prescriptions is continuing to decrease, though not nearly as rapidly as I believe it should. Uh, the number of deaths from overdoses of legally prescribed opioids is also continuing to decrease slightly. But that red line does not show total opioid deaths. It only shows deaths from overdoses from legally prescribed opioids. It does not include heroin and fentanyl, and we're going to, going to get to that fairly shortly. You can also see that around 2011, that both of those uh, uh, lines peaked and have decreased a little bit since that time. So that's because of the growing awareness, going back to 2011 before, and, be, and before that, of the dangers of opioids and, and the escalating number of opioid deaths. And people that prescribe opioids, myself included, uh, have cut back their opioid prescribing some Slightly, some, much more than that. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Now, in the United States, in terms of opioids, we're way off the bell curve. We have about 5% of the world's population, but believe it or not, we prescribe and we consume about 80% of the world's prescription opioids. We prescribe and we consume far more opioids per person than any other country in the world. So this epidemic we're talking about is not a worldwide epidemic. It's not even a Western Hemisphere epidemic. It's primarily an American opioid epidemic. And unfortunately, it's an iatrogenic opioid epidemic. Iatrogenic means something that is the result of medical care or medical treatment. And unfortunately, the main reason that this opioid epidemic began, and one of the reasons why it's continuing, is the overprescribing of opioids. Now this slide shows the number of opioids, the standard uh, number of opioids prescribed for every million people 
At the very top is the United States. Below that, the second country is Canada, which probably uses about 30% less than us, then Germany, then Denmark. And you can see it, most of the European countries prescribe about one quarter of the opioids that we do per person per year. So where do patients get their first opioids? Where do we get, when, where do we get our first exposure to opioids? Well, the large circle on the left, those are uh, people, represents people that got their first exposure to opioids. In the blue, you can see that 54% of Americans get their first opioids free from a friend or a relative's prescription. In the green on the left, you can see that about 15% of them buy them or steal them from a friend or relative. So almost 70% of Americans' first exposure to opioids are opioids that were prescribed to someone else, either a friend or relative, leftover pills. Well, where did the friend or relative get the opioids? Well, that's the smaller circle on the right. About 82% of those people get their first opioids from one doctor. Now, if you're going to have opioids prescribed to you, the way to do it is to have it prescribed only by one doctor, for obvious reasons. You don't want multiple doctors prescribing opioids to the same patient. So about 82% of those patients got the opioids appropriately from one doctor, but they were prescribed too many pills. They had leftover pills in their glove compartments, in their medicine cabinets, in their drawers or their purses. And the result was those pills that were prescribed to one patient ended up being the first opioids used by other patients, other people that were never prescribed the opioids in the first place. So that's a major problem. And one of the themes of this talk is if opioids are going to be prescribed, we want them to be prescribed in minimal doses for a minimal number of days, not big numbers of pills. Well, who prescribes them? Well, in decreasing volumes, family doctors, internal medicine doctors, both of those are primary care doctors, orthopedists, dentists, physiatrists who are rehab specialists, pain specialists for obvious reasons, emergency physicians like myself, and then general surgeons. So family doctors and internal medicine doctors, why do they prescribe so many opioids? No, number one, there are a lot of those doctors. They're the main primary care doctors for adults in this country. And number two, the vast majority of people with chronic pain are taken care of by family doctors and internal medicine doctors. You'd think they'd be taking care of specialists, but the reality is there are very, very few pain specialists in this country. In fact, where I work in Middlesex County, there are no pain specialists. So if someone has chronic pain, they're either going to be continue to be taken care of by their primary care doctor, their family doctor, or their internal medicine doctor, or they need to be referred to a pain specialist in Hartford or New Haven. Orthopedists, for obvious reasons, they deal with broken bones. Dentists prescribe about 8 or 9% of the opioids, but they're the number one prescriber of opioids to teenagers and young adults. Why would that be? Wisdom teeth. When dentists pull wisdom teeth, it's very typical uh, that they prescribe Vicodin or Percocet, which are opioids. Um, and from all accounts that I've heard, far more many pills, far, far more pills than are needed by the patients. Now, in their, uh, in their defense, they are beginning to reduce that practice and sometimes even, not even uh, prescribing opioids at all for wisdom teeth. And emergency physicians uh, like myself, we prescribe about 3 to 5% of the opioids in the country. But we, like the dentists, uh, can be, maybe are the doctors that are prescribing the first opioids, that are giving a patient, a young patient, their first exposure to opioids. And that first exposure to opioids can lower the threshold for them continuing to use opioids and getting into trouble further down the line. Well, now we're seeing dramatic increases in heroin and fentanyl deaths. Well, why is that? Well, chronic opioid medications cause tolerance to the opioids. So most patients over time will develop increasing tolerance to the opioids, which means they need larger doses for the same pain relief. So patients, not all of them, but some of them, go to their doctors asking for more pills or higher doses for the same pain relief. The doctors might start getting nervous because of all the side effects of opioids, including death and don't increase the pills or doses. And the patients may begin doctor shopping, going from doctor to doctor or ER to ER, trying to get their prescriptions, their opioids written for by prescri by, in prescriptions. And if they can't get the 
opioids prescribed, they might start buying the opioids on the street or on the black market. And if you're buying opioids illegally, the biggest bang for the buck by far is heroin. Heroin is, has gotten much stronger and much cheaper, and it's much more available. So if, you want, if you're addicted or dependent on opioids or addicted to them and you want pain relief, you're very, and, and you can't get them prescribed legally, you're very quickly going to learn that you need to buy it on the black market and then buying pills is very expensive. So more and more people are turning to heroin, sometimes with fentanyl as well. So now we're seeing a big increase in overdoses from heroin and fentanyl uh, throughout the country and in Connecticut as well. Now, how do people die from opioids? Well, opioids relieve pain. They also they sedate people. They make them <coughs> sleepy. They cause constipation. But in high enough doses, opioids, uh, they actually sedate the respiratory center of the brain. So we breathe because the respiratory center in our midbrain is keeping track of our oxygen levels and our carbon dioxide levels. When our oxygen levels drop or our carbon dioxide levels in our bloodstream rise, our midbrain tells us to take a breath or take more breaths. Opioids in strong enough doses sedate the respiratory center of the brain so we lose our respiratory drive. So our breathing slows down and then can actually stop completely. And people that die of opioid overdoses die of suffocation from lack of oxygen or too much carbon dioxide in their brains, in their bodies. So this graph shows all opioid overdose deaths from 2000 to 2015. Um, first of all, you can see that it's not decreasing. We're not at the peak yet, um, and we don't know when that peak is going to be. The second thing is that uh, this line here is uh, commonly prescribed opioids. Com the one that says commonly prescribed opioids are the legally prescribed opioids. And you can see again, that's similar to the graph I showed you before, that continued to increase until around 2011 when it has begun to decrease somewhat. And you can see up to about 2011, the majority of people who were dying from opioid overdoses were dying from legally prescribed opioids, in other words, the commonly prescribed opioids. But around 2010, 2011, we began seeing heroin, which is the blue line, begin to rise dramatically and steadily. And then the gold line is the most worrisome opioid now, which is fentanyl. It's labeled other synthetic opioids, but it's primarily fentanyl. And fentanyl, just the last three or four years, has dramatically taken off in terms of uh, being mixed in the opioids that people are buying illegally. Uh, this graph only goes up to 2015, but if it went up to 2017, we would see the heroin line, and particularly the fentanyl line, much, much higher than the commonly prescribed opioids. So the new growth, in the beginning it was legally prescribed opioids, but more and more today, it's the illegal opioids, such as heroin and particularly fentanyl. In 2017, just last year, more than 60% of the overdose deaths in Connecticut were caused by fentanyl, primarily fentanyl. So patients are buying stronger, more dangerous opioids. They don't know what they're buying. The old heroin was from Columbia primarily. It was about 10% pure. The new heroin more and more is coming from the western coast of Mexico. It's much stronger. And fentanyl is the new player. Now, all the other opioids we've been talking about tonight are semi-synthetic. In other words, they start with the opium, the powder from the opium latex in laboratories and develop all the other opioids. Fentanyl is totally synthetic. It does not come from the opium powder. It's made in a chemical laboratory. However, it affects the opioid receptors in the brain and the body, just like all the opioids does, uh, all the other opioids do. So it acts just like all the other opioids. It's smuggled and it's usually manufactured these days in Mexico or China. It's smuggled in or mailed in from, from China, and it's 20 to 30 times the strength of heroin. Sometimes it's added to heroin, or actually added to pills, or even stamped into pills, and there's a variable amount of fentanyl, an unknown amount, that's mixed into heroin or the pills or the powders. So it's at a high risk of overdoses because the amount of the fentanyl being mixed in is so variable. Now, in the, the penny on the upper right, you've got some powder next to that. That is a 
lethal dose, a deadly dose of fentanyl for someone that is not a regular opioid user. So most of you in the audience, if we got that, if we snorted that or it was injected into our veins, it would kill us. It would actually stop our breathing. A deadly dose of fentanyl is about equal to two grains of salt. That's how concentrated it is. So if you're a drug dealer and you're mixing up, you've got some uh, heroin or some cocaine, and you're mixing it up, you might be mixing some talc in to dilute it so you can sell more of it, but you also might be mixing in some fentanyl to try to make it stronger. And unfortunately, the amount of fentanyl that's being mixed in is not regulated, it's not standardized. So a heroin user or cocaine user that is used to buying their cocaine or heroin from a dealer in the city or in New London or New Haven, uh, if a particularly strong batch gets on the street that has an unusually large amount of fentanyl in it, all of a sudden people that are normally uh, simply enjoying these drugs or taking them for pain can overdose because of the strength of the fentanyl that's mixed into them. Now we can compare strengths of opioids <clears throat> using morphine as the gold standard. So one morphine milligram equivalent, or one MME, is equal to the analgesic effect or the pain relieving effect of one milligram of morphine. And using that, we can compare the strength of all the opioids that we're talking about tonight. Tramadol, whose brand name is Ultram, is about one-tenth the strength of morphine, or 0.1 MME. Codeine is about one-sixth. Hydrocodone, which is in Vicodin, is equal to one. So that milligram for milligram is about as strong as morphine. Oxycodone, which is in Percocet, is 50% stronger, so it's equal to one and a half. Hydromorphone, which we call dilated, is about three times the strength of morphine. Heroin is, averages about three to four, but fentanyl is 50 to 100 times the strength of morphine. So you can see that if somebody is buying drugs illegally and there's a unusually large amount of fentanyl uh, in whatever they're buying, whether that's a pill or a powder, uh, that can give result in a toxic dose, a lethal dose. Now, the more MMEs per day that someone's taking, the more the addiction risk is and the greater the overdose risk. If someone's taking under 20 MMEs per day, that's a fairly low risk of addiction and overdose deaths. But if they get up to 90 MMEs per day, that's 10 times the risk of just taking 20 a day. And the risk of addiction or overdoses increases with each day of taking prescription opioids and higher doses of opioids, more MMEs per day. But any MMEs per day, either short term or long term, have some risk of leading to addiction and overdoses. So how many MMEs per day are prescribed these days? Well, if someone's getting, now Tylenol number three is Tylenol with 30 milligrams of codeine in it. Someone's getting four Tylenol number threes, that's 18 MMEs per day. If tramadol comes in a 50 milligram pill, if someone's getting four of those a day, that comes to 20 a day. If someone's getting Vicodin four a day, that's about 20. But if someone's getting four Percocet a day, that's up to 30. If a doctor writes a prescription for Vicodin saying take one to two every four to six hours as needed for pain, that means someone could be taking two Vicodin every four hours and following the prescription, that's 60. Or if someone writes a prescription for Percocet, saying take one to two Percocet every four to six hours as needed for pain, that can be as many as two every four hours, that's 90. And OxyContin, 60 milligrams twice a day is 180. So you can see it's very, very easy with prescriptions that are commonly written to get into dangerous levels of opioids that can result in abuse, uh, dependency, addiction, and overdoses. When I look at opioid use in individuals, I, I think there are basically three main phases that we should consider. The first one is the early phase, which is when someone's been taking opioids for under one week. The next is the middle phase, when they've been taking the opioids for one, from one week to three months. And those patients, as they're getting uh, habituated to it, and they begin developing tolerance of it, some of those patients will desire more pain relief or a high, euphoria or high, leading to repeated use. And oftentimes they're requesting increasing doses or increasing MMEs per day to get the same effect because of the tolerance to the opioids. And over time, as those patients are getting closer to three months of use, 
they become increasingly dependent or addicted to them. Now, there's a difference between dependency and addiction. If I'm smoking a pack of cigarettes a day for the last 10 years, and I try to stop cold turkey, I'm gonna have some physical withdrawal symptoms. That means I'm dependent on the cigarettes, to, on the nicotine to some degree. That's dependency. But I'm not committing crimes. I'm not, it's not ruining my life. I'm not losing my job and, and causing problems in my family, hopefully. But if I'm taking a drug like uh, an opioid on a regular basis and then I stop, I'll also get physical withdrawal symptoms. That's dependency. But if, in, but if the symptoms are so bad that I start committing crimes in order to get uh, more, get the drug, or uh, that's creating problems with my family life, or my work, et cetera, or I'm committing crimes in any form, that's addiction. So dependent, addiction is really dependency with criminal activity. In the late phase, if someone's taking opioids for three months and beyond, a lot of these patients are physically dependent or they're addicted to it. And those patients, if they can't get the prescriptions filled by doctors, they will begin prescription drug seeking or doctor shopping or buying opioids in the black market, such as buying heroin or uh, fentanyl. And that's where we're seeing the escalating overdose deaths from prescription or illegal opioids. The majority of the people that are dying from opioid overdoses are people that are in that late phase. Now, there's lots of attention being given to the late phase. These are the patients, again, that are already dependent or addicted to them. Uh, why is that? Well, opioids and deaths and addiction are, they sell newspapers, they're headline grabbers. So we're seeing lots of media and government and healthcare organizations' attention about people that are dependent, addicted, or overdosing, et cetera. There's more and more funding or treatment for treatment for people that are addicted. More and more doctors are getting nervous and beginning to taper or cut off opioids because of all the uh, fatal fatalities. There's lots of suboxone and methadone being prescribed. Those are drugs that are, are administered, prescribed to people that are addicted, that are actually effective treatments. More and more people going into rehab centers, more and more people coming to the ER with addiction, overdoses, or deaths. More and more people going to jail, and more and more people ending up in the morgue. Now, I'm all for more resources being devoted to people that are addicted or dependent or have overdosed. Uh, these people have major risks of uh, serious morbidity and, and deaths as well. However, there isn't enough attention being devoted to the early phase and the middle phase. Again, the early phase is when someone has been taking opioids for under a week, and the middle phase is when they've been taking it from just one week to three months. This is where the future opioid addicts are being made, even today. Now this is a picture of a man and a woman who are in a, in a room with a sink that's faucet is running and the sink is overflowing and the water's uh, overflowing the sink and spilling out onto the floor. And they are working furiously with mops trying to mop up the water on the floor. But they're not addressing the cause of the problem. They're not turning off the faucet. And until they've turned off the faucet, they're gonna be mopping up the floor forever. To a large degree with the opioid epidemic, we've been putting too much energy, well, we've been putting enough, we've been putting a lot of energy into mopping up the floor, treating people that are dependent or addicted, but we haven't been putting enough energy into turning off the faucet. And that faucet is prescription opioids. We need to turn off the faucet. About 75 to 80% of new heroin addicts actually begin with legally prescribed opioids. And about almost 70% of those first-time opioid users are actually getting the pills from a friend or relative's leftover uh, opioids pills. So every, every opioid prescription has some risk of leading to dependency, addiction, and overdoses and deaths. What we need to do, what we're doing tonight, is educating. Uh, I speak with doctors as well, to doctors as well. Tonight we're educating the public that we need to minimize the opioids whenever we can. We need to dramatically reduce prescribe of opioids. We ideally would go back to the levels of 1995 before this opioid epidemic began, which is about an 80% reduction. Now, it's, I'm not advocating eliminating opioids, but a dramatic reduction to what was prescribed just about 20 years ago.
And if we don't dramatically reduce the prescribing of the opioids, we are going to continue to create more new opioid addicts than our society has the resources to treat. So the opioid faucet is prescription opioids. And prescribers like myself and lay people and, and uh, patients like yourselves can all do our parts. So what can you do? You don't write prescriptions for opioids. People like doctors like me do. Well, first thing is we all need to realize that opioids should only be used for people who have severe and acute pain. Not mild pain, not moderate pain, and not chronic pain. The first thing we really need to ask is, do we really need to get to zero pain? And the reality is in most of the world, uh, in fact, most of the elderly people in our country, and by elderly I mean the greatest generation, the people that were through, uh, went through the Depression in World War II, and most of the people in other countries of the world don't believe that we need to get to zero pain, that a little pain, mild pain or moderate pain can be tolerated without medications. We need to ask if pain medicines are really needed. Can we, can we treat the pain without medicines at all? Can we treat with ice or heat or elevation or ACE bandages or stretching or physical therapy or walking? And if medicines are needed, we want to always start with non-opioid medications like Tylenol or Advil, Motrin or Aleve, or combining Tylenol with Advil or, uh, Advil or Aleve. If we do get a prescription for pain medicine, we want to know what's in it. Uh, I'm amazed how many people I hear when I speak around the state who tell me that a family member got a prescription for an opioid and they were never informed that it was potentially addicting medication. So if we do get a pain medicine, we always want to ask the doctor, does this contain an opioid? And we want to tr try to get the doctor to avoid opioids if possible, uh, prescribe the, the weakest ones, not the strongest, and the, with the smallest numbers. And we want to avoid opioids unless the pain is severe and acute. We need to consider the risks and the, versus the benefits of all the medicines we take, particularly opioids, which I think I've shown to you tonight have, to, to, shown to you tonight have dramatic risks. What else can you do? Well, if opioids are needed for severe pain, we want to ask for low doses of fairly the weaker opioids, such as tramadol or, vi or hydrocodone or Zinvicodin. We want to avoid the stronger ones like Percocet or Dilaudid because the stronger ones are more likely to lead to uh, abuse, dependency, addiction, and overdoses. We want to ask for a low number of pills if, the, if opioids are needed, 10 pills, 12 pills, maybe 15, and ideally take them just for two or three days. The days of writing opioid prescriptions for 30, 40, 50, 90 pills need to end. Those extra pills in the medicine cabinet are extremely dangerous. We want to stop the opioids if we're taking them as soon as possible and transition to either non-opioid medicines or no medicines at all. And now that I'm educating you folks here, I want all of you to educate everyone you know, your family and your friends, your associates, that the risks of addiction and overdose of opioids are very significant. And our young people need to understand that. If we do our prescribed opioids when we're, they're no longer needed, we want to throw them away. We want to get rid of them. Most uh, police departments and most drug stores have drug disposal bins, which is just like a mailbox. Just walk in, throw the bottle in there, you're done with it. We do not want opioids to be lying around the house unlocked. And if someone is taking opioids, we want to be sure they're not taking other medicines that also slow down their breathing, such as benzodiazepines like Valium or Ativan, sleep medicines or alcohol, all those should be avoided completely with any opioids. Well, how about opioids for chronic pain? Well, that's very controversial. There are actually no good studies that show long-term improved pain scores with chronic opioids. Why is that? Because our bodies, our brains, develop tolerance to the drugs. <clears throat> and over time, in most people, they lose their effectiveness when they're taken for more than a couple months. But if someone is taking opioids for chronic pain, we want them to minimize the strength, to minify, minimize the MMEs per day. And if they're absolutely needed, we want them to be prescribed by only one doctor, not multiple doctors. And the patients ideally should work with the doctors to try to taper down the level of the opioids to get the lowest MMEs possible or maybe even get off the opioids over time. 
Well, we're making some progress. In the United States, we've seen about a 23% reduction of prescribed opioids from the peak year, which is in 2011. But the rate today is still about, believe it or not, three times what we prescribed in 1999 and still four times what's prescribed in Europe. So we've got a long way to go. In Massachusetts, just last year, they were able to reduce their opioid prescriptions by 30% compared with three years before. And actually, last year, they saw about a 10% drop in opioid overdose deaths. I don't think that's the, going to be the case in Connecticut. Uh, at my hospital, Middlesex Hospital and Hartford Hospital's emergency departments, in about a five-year time, we were able to reduce our opioid prescribing by 50%, which is a step in the right, a big step in the right direction, but we think we can even reduce opioid prescribing further. So the point is that we control the faucet, not just the doctors that prescribe, but also patients as well, people like yourselves. We're in this together. If we're going to end this epidemic, all of us, prescribers, healthcare workers, and patients need to understand that we must dramatically reduce our opioid prescribing so we can work together to turn off the opioid faucet. Thank you.